bug fix. This is Walter Cronkite, reporting from the place where news happens, mouse and wings. Good evening, and have a pleasant tomorrow. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Mouse and Weens. We're back again. Another week. Hello. Yay. There's Weens <laughs> over there with the beautiful... Uh, uh, palm frond behind her if you happen to yes. see us on youtube and i'm upstairs in this weird lighting but that is okay because we have an amazing guest with us i'm so excited yay for jamie morja grume i'm gonna throw your maiden name in there too because that's how i know you <laughs> i know that's so funny hi, hi. Um, i know i i really wish i never changed my last name i'm really really upset about it now yeah, because well, now I'm stuck with my ex-husband's last name on everything I've ever done. So yeah, this is a, yeah, a, now I'm the remarried. plight. <laughs> I know. Yes, and now now you're married again, and you could potentially change it, right? I don't know. I could. It's just that my books and everything I've done is in my hus- my ex-husband's last name. I'm trying That's to convince right. my current husband to take my ex-husband's last name so that oh. we all have it. <laughs> that <laughs> is kidding, so oh my God. on brand for you. Okay, because uh, boys and girls and listeners, Jamie is a very progressive thinker and doer, and uh, you may know her from the, I guess it's, infamous famous the cover of time magazine from 2012 where she is standing up breastfeeding her son who is standing up too it was kind of a a big deal back in the day and still is because now we're at the 10 year anniversary of that um and yeah. and and an author too that has since spawned a, a book i'm going to hold it up for our camera here called um Modern Attachment Parenting, and do you, I don't know if you can see all my tabs, but I, I read a ton of it, and I made little notes everywhere, so, um, but yeah, let's jump in, and the reason we're having Jamie on, too, is because she's like our little sister, because yeah. <laughs> my very best friend in the world growing up is her sister, so yeah, Yay. it's just so fun to hear a family voice in, <laughs> in my ears. <laughs> So, Jamie, will you tell? Yes. Sorry, I jumped no, in go there for it. and go stepped for it. on all of you. But I want to, you know, people are going to be really curious about the Time Magazine cover. So, what happened with that? How did that all come to fruition? Um, it was kind of by accident. I started a blog to keep really all of our friends updated on uh, the adoption process of our oldest son, um, who was adopted from Ethiopia. And I didn't really understand how blogs worked back then. Uh, um, and I didn't realize that we had like more people. It was like a blog spot blog from back in the day. I don't even know if people remember those, but um, mm-hmm. I didn't realize that people were reading it that I, that I didn't know. And I must have mentioned something about Aram nursing, which was just really common in our family, as you guys know. I mean, I was breastfed for until I was six, I think. Um, and so I didn't think anything of it, but all these women started te- talking or making comments and really were struggling with um, with feeling like they were being ostracized for their breastfeeding choices. And so I just started talking about it more because I didn't realize that it was such a problem socially mm-hmm. in this country. Um, and because of that, Time found me and then asked me to um, <sighs> to, to come and pose potentially for a picture inside of an article on Dr. Sears uh, in Time Magazine. So, and there were multiple families and I think only one was going to be chosen for the picture too. I didn't think we were going to get picked and it really wasn't supposed to be a cover photo. Um, Whoa. They chose that. Yeah. So it was, That's it was, amazing. And how old yeah. was your son at that time? Three. Okay. He was and a that, tall did that year old. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. Well, yeah, but then everybody in my family is, except for me, 
I got my grandmother's jeans. Oh my That's God. true. So the perspective. So you're a yeah. little more petite. Yeah, I'm only five four, and I think yeah, Ellie's five nine. Yeah, so something like that. She right. was. You guys are the same height. Yeah, right? although I've been shrinking. Yeah. I'm now down to five seven. I was five eight. Oh no. <laughs> I think I think Allie's. Yeah, I think my sister is down to five seven as well. She came Yay. to visit the other day, and I was like, oh, it's like a little little fawn. Oh, <laughs> oh sweet Allie. See, I know, I know. It's so cute. So Jamie, will you explain what attachment parenting is and why? So you didn't think anything of it, but when you did your blog, they came along, and then did that create? First of all, what is attachment parenting and why was that so controversial? Was the cover, like, did you start getting crazy responses from that? Yes. I mean, yes. Oh, my gosh. I think I have PTSD from that. Um, but <laughs> I, uh, attachment parenting was, co- the term was coined by Dr. Sears um, when the baby book came out, I think, in 19... 19- 95, although in the 50s, attachment parenting was um, getting studied study by John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth. Um, there's a lot of research on that. Um, that was, it's talking about attachment cells. So really, when you, you were born up until, I mean, we always kind of have, we as humans um, need to attach. And so we make these sort of um, functioning attachments to each other. And so when they work and it's healthy attachments, so, and you get that from your primary caregivers when you're first born. So those first few weeks of life are even extremely important. But, you know, for the first few years, it's um, you're making, you're starting to learn your attachment and who you're attaching to. So if that gets corrupted in certain ways, you can have um, issues with attachment. So there's anxious styles of attachment where you get very clingy or very codependent, avoidant, where you kind of, you know, those are the people who won't commit to a relationship when they're adults. So it's does so when you foster good attachment as a child you typically become a better functioning adult with um, ways of being able to uh, regulate like by yourself or co-regulate with other people better if that makes okay sense. i took a test I, you inspired me i took a test and i am pre <laughs> what is it preoccupied anxious so that's not that's not the but i can't figure it out joelle and i were just saying that mom was a great parent so I don't know what happened could something have happened later in life or is it usually attachment theory is that or attachment so wait attachment Uh, theory and yeah you tell me (laughs) it well it's I mean I so my parents were attachment parents and I have attachment disorders as well so I don't think it it's no one's doing anything 100% and I think it's normal to have I mean, your world isn't perfect. So it's not necessarily even your parents. You could have had a traumatic, something could have traumatic could have happened to you as a child, or maybe even like certain, certain children, even perhaps preschool does it to them, or um, I'm more anxious. And now, and as an adult, I become anxious avoidant. But I think that that's from my experiences with adults. So I think it does, it, it can change. You actually can become traumatized and develop attachment disorders as an adult. But I don't I'm, don't quote me on that because I'm not 100 okay. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that's the thing with yeah, theories. No, a lot of these theories, it's like, how can you really prove that this causes that? And I mean, there's a myriad of reasons. Like, you know, we're born a certain way. We have certain wiring. We have certain chemicals that makes us right. who we are. But yeah. Right. No, exactly. And I think it's just, I think it's pretty common. Even if your mom, it could have been, you never, you don't know what it was. Like your mom was a great parent, but so was my mom. But there were definitely, and she like, I co-slept with her. She did every single like, quote unquote, attachment parenting tool that, um, that Dr. Sears has mentioned. And I still, you know, you still get kind of anxious. Think of how anxious Allie was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. kind of wired in you too, to be a little bit more codependent, but um, yeah, but I think it really does. If you see children, like um, a good example is the orphanages in Eastern Europe, like Romania, uh, they did a lot of studies on them and the children weren't being touched and weren't being um, taken care of and their needs weren't being met. And they lost, They you notice that the kids weren't crying anymore, weren't doing anything because that's how children communicate with their, their parents or their primary caregivers is, you know, they cry, they fuss to be picked up. Um, and when they aren't crying anymore it's because they've lost hope that anybody's going to come there for them oh, and so God. that's actually really sad. yeah and there's a, and those children did develop um reactive attachment disorder which is um an extreme form of 
of an attachment disorder um, that you see primarily in very abused children or children that are in institutions like that, um, mm. where nobody you know touched them or held them, and they do kind of lose the ability to um, function as a normal adult. Um, so you see violent tendencies. There's a myriad of things that happen to them. Yeah, yeah I can think of a couple of kids who I think were adopted from Eastern Europe now and grew up with my kids and and they've had trouble in school very yeah very violent and um yeah just dysregulated yeah, it's just sad because it's not yeah the children it's not the children's fault at all but it's, it's, the, it's the the parent who has taken that on or the primary caregiver who's taken that on really there's a lot of work that needs to go into m- m- mitigating some of those issues and you know sometimes they're lifelong Right. Yeah. So yeah. what is the primary healthy way that you feel that we do need to attach to our kids? What are some tips you can give people for secure? What it, do you call it secure attachment or what do you say when it's the best form of attachment? When it's healthy attachment, it's considered secure attachment. And um, I think that I don't actually know one person who's perfectly securely attached. So I guess that it's but but we want to push towards that. So mm-hmm. um I think that the best ways of doing that are basically you need to kind of look at your child's unique needs and meet those. And it's not your wants. It's not, you're not spoiling your child, but if your child, there's biological, there's it's communication that we have with, I mean, even breastfeeding is a set of behaviors that we have where we're communicating. We're making eye contact with our baby when we're breastfeeding them. Um, There's ways that, that we're attaching or, um, we're communicating with them when we pick them up to when they cry so that they are if they're hungry if they're tired um, and if some children are just way more needy than other children they're high I think even Dr. Sears wrote about it it's a high needs child um, those children are really a lot of work but um, meeting those needs is even more important because those are the children that typically have issues when their needs aren't met um, and they're ignored or they're trying they try to in the 1950s especially or um, they had, oh my gosh, the worst baby book came out around that time too. Um, was but, that the Doctor uh, Spock had- book? Yes, was Dr. it? Spock that's book. that's what our mom had. I remember it always on our shelf <laughs> growing up. I actually called her before this interview to ask her how we were raised because I wasn't exactly sure. I knew that she had read that book, but I remembered her with Julianne since I'm the older sister. And she was very yeah. tender and caring with Julianne, and mm-hmm. and so I got the whole story. And she kind of did what you say to do in the book, which I love, which is kind of just go with nature and go with your intuition and work with what you've got. But, but go ahead, keep telling us your, your tips. Oh, no, no, no. That's, that's really it. I mean, it's not there. It's not about breastfeeding or baby wearing. Dr. Sears created all of those. He considers them tools and not rules. And he says that over and over again, people I think still don't really listen to that. Those aren't necessary things to attach to your child, but um, they're helpful in showing like those are some of those ways like holding your baby or keeping them close or um, bed sharing with your baby um, and co-sleeping. Those are ways that we biologically are connecting to our children. And those are really good ways to foster a, a secure attachment in them, but they're not necessary for it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then actually Dr. McKenna, who is in, at a Notre Dame, he came, he did a huge co-sleeping study that was, you know, at the time very controversial. And now it's just kind of solidifies what everybody thought um, before, which is bed, sh- or it's not bed sharing, co-sleeping. And he calls it breast sleeping. Um, when it's an exclusively breastfed baby um, and you're not under the influence of, you know, medications or drugs or alcohol, it's pretty much impossible for you to hurt your baby when you're bed sharing or co-sleeping with them. Um, And it's because, yeah, there's a, your baby is constantly breastfeeding at nighttime too. So when you're doing that, you are so in tune with your baby, your baby is actually, SIDS rates, I think go down to almost nothing. Um, And your baby is listening to your heartbeat. It's the heart is syncing up with yours, your breathing patterns. Um, are aligning. It's a lot of really interesting um, information that he found out. So anytime mm-hmm. you hear about co-sleeping deaths, they're always generally the person didn't even want to sleep with their baby. They were under the influence of something. They passed out on the couch. They rolled over on their baby. They smothered them. 
and those aren't like that's not what any co-sleeping parent does that's that's a totally different thing yeah Um, what about the husband if they're not as in tune with the baby um and they're in the bed because um, that's what mom said i asked her i said did we sleep with you did you co-sleep with us and she said no because your dad was so big our bed was small (laughs) and he was such a sound sleeper i really was worried that he was going to roll over on you guys but she had a bassinet right by the by the bed and so that was what she did and then so for me, she said she moved me into a room with the crib and that I was kind of like just went with the flow, adjusted, didn't cry a lot, went to bed. But Julianne was a little more needy and she <laughs> she had to put a twin mattress on the floor in Julianne in the in the nursery, I guess, where the crib was. And she would sleep there and hold your hand through the crib. Um, and that was kind of her way of doing it. And but she said she often just had to hold you up in a rocking chair all night. And um, and she said you were just super hungry and you nursed all the time. She could not fill you up. So <laughs> I think you're extra attached to mom because you were on the boob the whole time. She said. Aww, so I liked it. I, I would. That's so funny. Well, didn't Julianne win? Like, she won the award for having, like, she was a big baby, right? Yes. She was the, <laughs> she had the biggest chest circumference in the whole hospital. Or yes, sort of do. Yes. Great uh. thing. Yeah, it was, like, healthy, <laughs> robust baby that probably needed a lot of nutrients. Yes. Um, yeah, so she, yeah, I, well, okay, so what you're supposed to do, or they tell you now, which is helpful, is you put the mattress on the floor, mm-hmm. um, baby rolls off, it's not going to hurt the baby at right, all, and then right. you can, if, if you're worried about another person in the bed, you can always put the baby on the end then, and then there's also other things you can put on the bed so the baby won't fall off, or you can use a co-sleeper, which is now, that's the, I hated that thing, I got one, and I just, yeah. Never used it, but, um, it's kind of like a little it, it looks like a hot tub attached to a pool right kind of hangs out yeah, yeah, yeah. to the side of the bed it hangs, yeah. up, it hangs on the bed so if you want the bed up and you want it so it's, it's impossible to roll over on your baby and your baby's basically right next to you but for me I noticed that it, he slept better when he was touching me and yeah. then I also could just not wear a shirt and he could breath latch on and I got better sleep too so right wow yeah, Joel, I, would you consider doing that if you ever I, had another one? Yeah, I tried it with uh, the one the littles. Uh, when Toby first came home, my oldest, uh, I was like all about it. I'm like, okay, we're going to do this co-sleeping thing. And Dave could not handle the noises, the gurgles, <laughs> the, the wiggling, all the stuff. And he had just started a new law firm and he like needed his precious sleep. So... It was just our understanding that I would just kind of get up and go into the baby's room when he'd cry. So I did not co-sleep, but dang, did I rock that baby all night long and had him in my arms. And it was just, you know, you're just trying to survive at that point. And to get yeah, sleep was so I tough. I don't and, think it makes uh, a difference to the baby. I think it makes more of a difference to the parents, to be honest, with that yeah. kind of stuff. Because you're still... you're no matter what, especially with a new baby, you're going to be with them the majority of the night. So it's just, yeah. it's, um, if you don't mind getting up every time, I just, I think that's why a lot of people aren't having kids. To be honest. Yeah. A, lot it, are, a lot of people have like night doulas, which are, that's a new thing now is postpartum doulas are, are kind of like, kind of like having a nanny, but they're really there to help the mom. So they will bring the baby in to you and you can breastfeed that baby um, and they'll bring you snacks and they'll let you go back to sleep. And then when the baby falls asleep, they'll hold the baby the whole time for you yeah. while in the middle oh. of it. And you're just, now, how do you feel about that? That, yeah. that would have been great. Yeah. Well, how would that I fare? That. <laughs> oh my gosh. But then that's not really your mom. So could you, I mean, is it better to have? Yeah. So for with, pri- so we're, we're a social species just being primates. And so what you see is in, like if you look at any primates or if you look at any hunter gatherer type of um, or more village type human um, settings, it's not the, I think that's the other problem that we have here is like mom is the primary caregiver and it really shouldn't be like that. I mean, she should be the primary caregiver, but she should not be the only person, only caregiver. And so with this, you have most people, they throw the moms into a mom group where we're all like, you're considered clinically insane (laughs) you have a baby your hormones are there to protect that baby and keep that baby alive 
um, yeah. until it's five. And then if we're born, you know, we are bipedal. We have larger brains. Babies come out way earlier than any other mammal. Um, and so you're hardwired. And that's also another reason that we're um, semi-monogamous too. Like we're the only, really one of the only species that is like that um, as, as a mammal, because we have to keep this baby alive until five. That's the hardest time. Um, like that's for our species to keep them alive. And if you look in like other underdeveloped countries, um, the mortality, they call it inf- the infant mortality rate, which is considered zero to five is really high. Wow. Um, yeah. So, but because of that, you know, we have, um, you have moms that are just like really they're, they're primary caregivers, but they're tapped out. We're supposed to, we're not supposed to be with a bunch of other moms that have babies the same age. It's like putting a bunch of crazy people in one room. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. We need our village. We need our uh, grandmas and our aunties yes. and our sisters. And yes. it's a hundred percent. I, I so would Dula's feel that. Kind of creating yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. can, getting, and um, one of my friends, she got, she tried to get doulas in all different age ranges even brought like you know an elderly woman who was a postpartum doula in so that she can kind of create that environment but yeah most of the time you see you know 12 year old little girls um and then the little boys too but it's a lot of it is very um it's a very much of a matriarchy too a lot of little girls taking care of the babies the old the little sisters or the the, the other children in the village and then you'll see aunts uncles, everybody. And they'll be wet nursing too. So you'll see like, some, you'll go over, someone will nurse the baby for you if you're not around. It's not mm-hmm. like a, that's not a, a stigmatized thing in, in most other cultures, yeah. which is really interesting too. So yeah, so mom gets a break. So, yeah. okay. Also, we just, I had a class today and it was, you know, it brought up feminism and the problems in our society. Where does the man stand and how important it is for them to be equally involved or... Or how involved should the man be? Do you have any info on that? Oh, pretty. I mean, I'm assuming pretty involved. I, <laughs> I just logically would want you'd want the husband to be involved. But again, like you know, because we are semi-monogamous and children, like we do have the most vulnerable um, infant in in mammals, basically out of all of them. We're, we're so helpless when we're born. Men are really supposed to come in and help pr- protect and take care of um, this baby. And um, it's up until they're five. So at that point, I guess everyone can go their separate ways if they want, but that's not really what our culture does. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that, that's um, like hardwired in us. Um, so men, if they're not present, that's really not a biological norm. And so they, I think that they should be really kind of, it's hard because, you know, if you are breastfeeding and you're exclusively breastfeeding, a man can't do that much. And pumping is awful. If you don't, if you don't have to do it, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Um, just because it is really hard on your body. Um, I don't know is if it? I would have been able to, I, I felt like I had to pump when Aaron was in the NICU. And I just remember thinking of all my friends who had done it for at least a year while they worked. And I was, really kind of in awe of them because I was like, I don't know if I could do this. It's, it's, um, it's a different feeling, um, than I just didn't like it. I really didn't like it. Yeah. Well, um, A, you feel hard. like a cow and B, it becomes this, yeah, mechanical, strange. It's not that loving and the letdown and all yeah. the signals that the baby gives you and, and the bonding. And it's so nice. It's such a nice, sweet feeling. Yeah. And yeah, now what do you say to parents who can't nurse for whatever reason? Um, and then I think you had something in your book about men can help with the um, baby wearing and things like that too, right? There is the skin to skin. Absolutely. And- yeah, so they can they can absolutely. I mean, it it really is when the baby's a newborn, you can pretty much expect you know the mom to be doing a lot as far as the feedings and everything goes. But the man can support the mom, and I think that that's really. Um, really, really important. I mean, this is if you have a heterosexual nuclear family, which a lot of people don't anymore too. So it kind of doesn't, doesn't apply to them. Um, I don't want to offend anybody, but uh, yeah, but I think that the, I think, yeah, men can, if you, I mean, if you are pumping, of course, dad can give the baby a bottle, but if you're not, he can baby wear, he can spend quality time just with you while the mom's breastfeeding he can you know bring the mom food he can be present with the baby i mean mm-hmm. there's a there's a lot of things that can happen or just the baby will mom sleep too right right so yeah. what do you both think will happen there's the shifting paradigm of men take 
becoming the primary caregiver as the woman goes to work. Is that going to screw things up for our society? Because they do it, Uh, I I think, in like other countries too. I think Denmark or Sweden, men get maternity leave just like women. And they're yeah, we are the only Western country that does not get mandated paid parental leave. We don't get maternity leave, and we don't get paternity leave. And it's just, I can't believe that. And we're the world's richest country. Come on, guys. Yeah, (laughs) we have the highest maternal mortality rate too. We have the highest maternal mortality rate in the developed world too. Really? I mean. Yeah, it's really, really, compared to the other countries, too, it's a lot higher. Mm. Um, so it's just, yeah, we're really, we should be, It's kind of, we're kind of a disgrace in that way, and we mm. could do a lot better. And if we did that, you know, I think it's 87% of women go into um, parenthood wanting to breastfeed their babies. And um, the mo- majority of them at some point, that, that those efforts are thwarted, and we want to figure out why that is and it's mostly social issues women are not given paid parental leave they're not you know we're not successful we're given they're given bad health advice there's not there's there's so many obstacles and those are the things like I don't care if you don't want to breastfeed but the majority of women can breastfeed there's a very small population who physically can't and that's obviously not their fault either and babies will be fine but we, it's, it's economical to breastfeed. There's a surf, you know, we need, we have a formula shortage right now. And because of that, we also have a human milk shortage and like, especially NICU babies, they need that um, mm-hmm. just to survive. You can't just, you can't give formula to a, to a NICU baby. Their stomachs aren't developed properly to digest Can you it. tell me what that is? I'm um, sorry. What's a NICU baby? Oh, oh a neonatal intensive care unit baby. So okay. those babies are born premature um or you know they have they're born with other problems and so they really need donor milk too and so right now we have a a huge shortage of donor milk and a shortage of formula too if we got those 87 percent of women who wanted to breastfeed to be able to breastfeed we wouldn't be having shortages of anything too so that would be and we we would normalize probably human milk banks a little bit more too which is i think really important for us to do as a just for a health care reasons for our country so rather than looking at it like looking at it more of a macro thing and it's like as a population we want to get our breastfeeding rates up and then not make women feel bad if they choose not to breastfeed or if they can't breastfeed but we want to make sure they actually are trying to meet their goals too Mm -hmm. so why don't people choose to breastfeed is it mostly a situation of employment or they just don't like the I think feeling. Someone, like, just might not want to. Well, because like it's almost ninety percent that do. So whoever mm. doesn't, they don't have to if they don't want to. Or I mean, if there are some sort of like for whatever reason, they like Queen Victoria. They were just I was just reading this thing on her, and she um, she thought that breastfeeding was was disgusting, and it was very. I mean, it was during the Victor- eighteen like mid to late 1800s when that was going on and for whatever reason she felt like a cow and it was definitely a social thing and um she didn't breastfeed any of her babies she probably had severe postpartum depression it looked like too but her daughters because she had nine babies she just she because there was no birth control back then um and she didn't really like babies very much too but she liked how you got them you said oh having them um, it was actually pretty funny, but, uh, yeah, but I guess that her daughters, when they had babies, they wanted to breastfeed them and they had to hide it from her. And then when she found out, she got furious at them and called them cows. Um, wow. Victoria. Yeah. So it's like, I know Queen Victoria, man. <laughs> um, she was, she was an interesting lady, but, um, yeah, I guess, you know, that's, that's cultural. That's not a. But for whatever, but whatever, you know, if you get in your head something, some reason that is off-putting, you know, those are things that we should probably try to normalize, but it's not really our responsibility to, like, make everybody feel like it's great. If you think it's gross, then don't breastfeed. It's no, mm-hmm. I mean, no one's trying to, to convince those people to, to do it. If you don't want right. it, you don't have to. So you must have been getting a lot of that messaging, too, when people saw you breastfeeding Aram when he was so much older, and then even Samuel when you adopted him, and then you nursed him, too, to have him bond with you and bond with his brother, right? And what was that oh, yeah. like, having to to field all of the, the hatred or the judgment? I mean, I can't imagine. I was but- so young. I was only 26 when it came out, and I was just really confused and scared. Um, 
and that now I don't, I really don't care. So I'm just, um, but I, even now like getting, I had an article just came out in Yahoo and for whatever reason, that thing went viral and all these people were coming to my Instagram page and it's just, I, I just didn't really care. Um, at this really? point, I remember being scared. I try not to read comments and they were everywhere when the time cover happened. But if I accidentally saw something or whatever, it really upset me. And I didn't want to look at it just because I didn't, it was, I think it was just, I was kind of paranoid at what people could potentially do. And now after, you know, I'm old and <laughs> old and kind of grumpy I guess I don't know uh, <laughs> you think of, you're like oh my god I go away I don't know you don't you don't these are just some random people and why are they like why would you spend that much time coming on someone else's page that you don't know to try to tell them something that right. they've already done like 10 years ago too it's just it's just it was bizarre oh I mean this but like it's not even worth talking about I guess is that's how I feel about it so right I, just, I don't really I, I can't even tell you what the comments were because I don't remember um good. Well, when, thing, I guess it, they don't affect me at all yeah yeah good what was the main controversy just that he was older and for the people that don't know like me what is the mm-hmm. time when they when society tells you to cut off breastfeeding that's really interesting and why does it bother why does it bother people so much right well the yeah, I guess that because people sexualize the, they objectify women and they sexualize women. So I think it was like a Madonna whore complex thing. And when babies are, I think that people got confused, especially back then. I mean, we, the, the marker of when to stop kept getting moved. It's like, you know, later and later. Um, and what helped was the World Health Organization um, basically said that um, you know, babies should be exclusively breastfed up to six months old. Then you can start introducing solid foods. I think people got confused that that's when you're supposed to wean your baby. And they're just saying that that's when you should only be giving breast milk. And then at uh. six months, you can start introducing solids and allow, you know, and complementary foods. Um, you can, you, and then your baby will primarily only have, you know, the main nutri- nutrients for the first year is probably still going to be breast milk. Um, but they said that, um, you know, put it at a minimum of two years to breastfeed during that time. Your baby will be eating food at that point too. But that was um, the World Health Organization's um, recommendation. And then the only, and basically every other medical group was basically, was saying the same thing except for the AAP. And I think the only reason for that um, was because of like just social pressures. They didn't want to freak people out because we were so, we're very sexually repressed here because we associate breasts with, I mean, they're secondary reproductive organs. They're basically made for, you know, for breastfeeding. That's, that's what they are, but not yeah. to say like the whole body can be an erogenous zone too. Yeah. Um, but because breasts were so hypersexualized too, they would say six months and then um, a minimum of one year. And they just changed it recently to two years. So they're okay. finally on board with us. Else. and that's a minimum so like you can go beyond that as far as you want they said two but it's basically two years and beyond so um, you were just at the forefront of the movement basically they just hadn't caught up guess, to you at the time yeah I mean other people have definitely been doing it for a while it's just that it was it's now it's just getting it's I have noticed a huge difference um with people you know breastfeeding now whenever you have a um you have a baby and you get like a photo package they add a breastfeeding to it too which I was like oh that's kind of kind of cute and funny and like how much that changed because that used to be even people just posting their breastfeeding photos which really helped normalize everything um that was considered like they would get attacked for that even when they had a a younger baby Mm so um yeah age like breastfeeding in public has definitely become more normalized and breastfeeding and allowing children to self-wean has become a little bit more normal I think as well and when do average on average when do children self wean? Kathy Detweiler did a study on this. So the natural human weaning age is anywhere from two. They she did a great study on it too, and she studied primates and humans and did um like it's a very comprehensive. She's a great anthropologist, a biological anthropologist. Uh, she looked at it. Any it's the biggest like range too it's um i think one and a half to two is the minimum that she's seen baby self wean all the way up to eight years old wow so wow. and that's that's their uh, that's the average so you can see um and they've never found any studies that if you like 
that breastfeeding past a certain age does no, there's no medical association that's even worried about it, that they won't even do tests on it. But it, there's basically nothing that says that it does any damage to your children. So you can breastfeed. So basically, as as it's just haters that think it's weird because it's yeah. not, it's not normal yeah. in society. So there's no negative consequence to it at all. Do they, I mean, the people, uh, what about psychologists? Do they say that forms too close of a bond and you should, like, what are the negatives? No, 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 no. Yeah, no, none. I mean, no one, no one studied enough. There's no, like, I think that there were people who weren't psychologists, but were very excited to talk about, um, about the subject that they didn't know anything about, like when the time cover came out, like everybody was coming out of the woodwork. And I remember this one woman was worried about, she kept saying enmeshment with it. And that's yeah. impossible. Like you can't, your baby will be, I remember my, because I was the only one that was breastfed really at all but I mean for definitely for past a year um of my mom's kids and she said that I was the most independent one out of all of them like I would I'd have good safety boundaries but I'd be the one that would go and want to explore a little bit more um or want to go off and I did I was the first one to like my sister was breastfed for like two weeks and she wanted to live five minutes away from my mom until she was (laughs) (laughs) so what interesting why, why did your mom choose not to do breastfeeding then with the first two she had them so much younger and she got mastitis with my sister at two weeks and my brother at three months. And the doctors back then gave her bad advice and told her she had to um, wean Aww. because you can't breastfeed with mastitis, which really the best thing to do is to take your antibiotics and breastfeed through it. You'll get, you'll get better faster. Wow. Uh, Julian, if you, yeah, you haven't had mastitis, right? I can't what imagine. is that? It's when you get an infection and you're, breast gets completely engorged and so so painful to the touch and oh it's the worst thing ever why does it happen i don't even know jamie you know more about this than i do if your milk sucks get clogged um it's just you have a bunch of you suddenly are making a bunch of breast milk and it's not like a super thin substance so it can clog up your duct um, and when something gets clogged, it generally, because so much stuff is getting created and pushed out, it, it will cause an infection. It's extremely easy to get mastitis. Most women get it. My mom got it with me too, but uh-huh. at that point she knew what to do. So she just breastfed through it. And I think she took antibiotics and she was, yeah, I think you have to take antibiotics. You feel like you're, I've never had it before, but apparently you feel like you're dying. Oh, um, it's the worst. I had a yeah. fever. I went into the shower yeah. and I was just trying to squeeze it out and like, just get it out of me and put like big cabbage leaves on my boobs at one point, but just had to put ice <laughs> everywhere. I was so hot oh, and no. finally got on antibiotics, but, and then like trying to nurse it out, but then it was so painful. Oh my gosh. I have to give you guys credit, yeah. you ladies credit, excuse me for saying guys, but you guys <laughs> ladies care. go through so much to have it's, children that it's got to be an incredible bond that nobody else understands if they don't have kids. I think so. I mean, but I think you can bond to your baby even if you don't breastfeed, but definitely, yeah, motherhood. Gosh. And and adoption too. Jamie, you can speak to that, but Oh yeah. Oh, it's that's weird, especially I mean, people don't I wish they talked about it more, but especially when you're adopting we adopted out of birth order, but we also adopted we didn't adopt a baby, which I think people have the same issues that they have when they bring home an older child. Um but it's different because it's a new baby and you are holding it so much all the time that you probably do bond and it's a little different mm-hmm. with a four-year-old like Samuel came home Aaron was two and a half and Samuel was four almost four uh, he was a month shy of his fourth birthday um and he came home and he I was like oh this is like he was so cute and so sweet but I was like what is his mom like in my my brain kept wondering when his mom was going to come and pick him up like I didn't it didn't register that he was my child at all um and so that was a really strange experience because you're like oh no no like you logically know that you've adopted a child but it's totally different than Mm -hmm. having a biological child where you have to learn you guys both have to learn how to attach to each other and um in some ways it it's really it's it's more exciting or it's more like it's really when it does start to happen it's um, really rewarding because it it's just like I don't know it's hard to explain it's it's really you have I kept thinking I'm like oh, okay this is this is really interesting and I kept thinking like yeah I kept thinking I was babysitting someone for a little wow. while um yeah. and a lot of other adoptive parents um 
like Melissa Faye Green talks about it a lot. She's, she adopted a lot of children internationally. Um, and really tells like kind of about like the, the darker parts of it too, because it's not easy and it definitely should not be like an option for infertility. If it's not right for you, it shouldn't be something it's, I, I'm really strongly believe in family preservation, um, above all else. And then adoption really is a last resort. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we're so happy with when we love Samuel so much and he's like the, the coolest kid, but we, yeah, I think it took me breastfeeding him because he had been breastfed by someone, um, up until probably the day of relinquishment or when he was in the orphanage. And so he, cause he could latch perfectly fine. Um, so when, what was that like that moment of just like, okay, we're going to try this. Was that, were you nervous or confident? Or? Yeah, no, I was, I don't, I don't really, I just remember him being really curious about Aram nursing. And then we taught, we had a doctor who was an adoption specialist that we hired to help us. And he's like, do anything you would to your biological child to um, your adopted child. And so we're like, okay, give us the green light to, to do that. And um, so I offered it to him and he latched on. And Aaron was nursing too. So I had, and they're both huge and I'm really small. He's the biggest Ethiopian person possibly, <laughs> like ever, ever adopted probably. I don't know. It was just, I was expecting like at least one of my babies to be kind of more of my size and it just it wasn't going to happen. No. But um, yeah, Aaron looked kind of confused. I remember him being confused at first. And then it kind of, I think it helped all of us attached to each other because Aaron realized that he wasn't he was equal to him like he wasn't mm-hmm. just a friend coming over <laughs> to play it helped me attach to Samuel because it went through like the physical motions and my brain started recognizing that it was my child and um and then with Samuel it helped it helped I think comfort him and give him something from home um you know it was nice to be able to give him that and then right. I think as, as soon as he started speaking English he weaned himself. And I think that that that's actually what my, um, our international uh, adoption specialist told us was go- going to happen. So wow, it was really, really cool. yeah. Yeah. That is so cool. And I, I, I have to commend you for, for doing this and, and in the public forum too, after your, your time cover and, and dealing with, you know, becoming a little bit hardened, uh, not really hardened, but knowing how to field the answers and how to talk about hard subjects. Because yeah, I followed you since day one when you were kind of in the public forum and you will post controversial things and discuss them and want them to be out there. And you have the chops to do it too. You have an anthropology background. Is that right? Yeah, anthropology, physical anthropology, and then a theology background as well, which I, I, that was more, I think, after I moved to Ghana, um, and I came back and for whatever reason wanted to study um, theology, which has been oddly extremely helpful with everything that I've done, too. So I'm really glad I I pursued that. Wait, can you say that it's ethnology? And what is that? Because I'm so sorry, I don't know. No, theology. Oh, theology. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Right? Yeah, yeah, theology, right? okay. yeah, theology, church history, um, and biblical studies, and then um, physical anthropology. So those were oddly very helpful for everything that happened to me, you know, after in, in my 20s. Um, but uh, yeah, at the time, I was like, I don't know, I'm just interested, so I'm going to study these things. I know I, <laughs> nothing, I wasn't planning on doing anything with them. I love so. it, but look at you now. Like you have a hundred percent done something with them, and yes, I know. Oddly, I know. I really love cool. it. Well, and so yeah. religion comes into it too. I'm sure you've had a lot of pushback from different groups or or support from different groups. Who who are the? Oh my gosh! Like, what would you See, say generally? I have, um, I mean, I think I don't know. I honestly, I, there's every single group of people. So like very science minded people are super into attachment parenting and the ideas of it. Um, and then there's also a lot of um, faith based groups that are as well. And then there's people in all those sectors that are just like kind of crazy too. Yeah. And they're, they're not yeah. like, it's not because they're interested in those things or that they're even experts in them. Cause they're definitely not at all. Um, but they like, you know, associate themselves with whatever that you know interest is or whatever and then they'll come at me you know very aggressively so it's I can't it's not there's no specific group everyone um yeah I had this one I think it was 
I can't remember what group it was, but it seems like some sort of a Quaker group of people. I got um, physical hate mail <laughs> through the oh my I mean, gosh. I would get, I would get, I would get weird stalker letters, but then I would get hate mail too. And oh one, this guy sent me, this guy sent me an eight page manifesto. Um, and I, at first I opened it up and I was still married to my ex-husband at the time. He was a police officer. And I was looking at it. I'm like, do you think there's anthrax in here? And he was like, <laughs> looking oh at my. it, started reading it. He was like, whoa, there's like pictures in here too. And he sent me like, it was the weirdest thing. I have it still. I kept it. Oh um, and I was like, do you think it's a threat? He would go to the police and he's like, no, because it was like repent or burn in hell. It kept saying over and over again. He goes, no, I think he wants you to repent or you'll burn in hell. Oh, my God. So just, just okay, pretty straightforward there. Oh, my God. Yeah. But it was like all these things, like how men's hair should be cut and if it was a cut a certain way or how women's hair should be and how long it needs to be. Oh boy. And then the... Um, I mean, it was it was very like mentally ill kind of stuff, but I think yeah. it was an actual religious yeah. group that said it. So it was it was something like if a man has longer hair than past his ears, it was homosexual. Everything oh, that was boy. bad was equated with homosexuality too. I mean, it was it was it was not the person was not well, but oh, it seemed like God. it actually came from a group of people. So I'm like, there's a cool congregation of these oh, people out there. There's something for everyone and some are yeah. not so great. Jamie, are you, how do you consider yourself? Are you Christian or atheist or? Um, I consider myself, I, I guess, a follower of Jesus, but I don't even like saying a Christian and I don't necessarily I don't. I'm a complicated creature, I guess. Yes. <laughs> in that Aren't way, we all? <laughs> yes, yeah, we are. Yeah, I was just curious, like yeah. if that was a religious response to you not believing or something. But yeah, no, yeah, I, oh, yeah, no, no. And I think, yeah, I don't think it was that. I well, maybe not. I yeah, I guess he, that person definitely associated breasts with um because he called me a pedophile multiple times oh in it too. Gosh. So yeah, yeah, no, that's those ones are. I mean. They're very concerning because if you worry about like is if this person knows my address, will they I, will they come to my my home and try to hurt me? And so those I don't mind them. It's not nice to hear you're a pedophile, even if you know you're not one. But that was yeah. beside the point. It was more like this person is it's legitimately crazy, and they yeah. might try to come and hurt. That's, That's scary about crazy. being in the public eye. And yeah, do you want to talk, Joel? Do you want to talk a little bit about the book? And Jamie, I want to hear. I want to hear about that and make sure that we, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. when did that come out? I love oh, yeah. the book. It came out the end of 2019, so right before the pandemic. It was quite a, quite a time. Um, yeah. And then, and yeah, I'm so, um, can I just so say to that. you, I want to point out it, it has a foreword from Alanis Morissette. No, Alanis is how you pronounce it. Alanis Morissette. Yeah. And, um, you guys have become friends. Right? This yeah, is... we have. Yeah. I love and it. then, oh, I don't want to forget, too. Um, also, um, Martha uh, Sears, Dr. Sears' wife, um, she edited every single, she went through every single page of the book when um, I had my first draft and edited, like, word for word everything with me. Wow. So it was, a, it was a really cool, full wow. circle moment to have the Sears family help me. I love um, it. With, with my book too. And yeah. Joe, for the listeners, doctor. what is the title? Sorry, for the people listening who sure, can't yeah, see. Modern Attachment Parenting: The Comprehensive Guide to Raising a Secure Child by Jamie Grumet. Wow. Uh, forward by <laughs> Alanis Morissette. Introduction by William Sears, MD. So yeah. yeah, it's it's really good. So go ahead, you you talk about the three Bs. Um, you you're very vulnerable in the book. You talk about how. Um, you thought you might be a failure. I love the stories in between. It's super honest. And it's also very, you. um, you're very uh, open and arms open and telling your readers to be open to whatever situation they're in and encouraging. Right. Like you can do it. If you can't nurse, that's okay. If you have a nanny, that's okay. If you have to go back to work, that's okay. Work with what works in your world and use your intuition and I love that I love that so much but oh thank you yeah yeah. I, yeah and I think that that's really important I I I don't know I just feel like we you know we do we live in a modern society and just part of like we there are like definite things that we we have biologically that our bodies you know it's 
evolution takes is very, very slow. And it's just that we're hardwired still for, you know, thousands of years ago. And, you know, we've, we've, we've developed a lot of things. Culture changes really rapidly. And for all, like, sometimes we do have to give up something like cars are a good example of that. Like we no longer have low impact cardio all day from walking. We have cars, which are great. And we don't want to not have them anymore, even though we need that low impact cardio. So with every, every culture, everything that we do um, in our culture, there might be a give and take for our biology. And so we've, you know, supplemented that with going to the gym or with, um, you know, trying to take walks. We have to consciously try to, to add that into our lives, though, or else, you know, we can get get ill just from, from not working out. And, like, the same thing goes with parenting, too. We have, um, you know, there's certain biological things that we're, like, that are wired for our babies and for us. And if we can't do that because our culture has changed, we need to figure out a way to mediate that. Right, right. It makes sense. Yeah. We are sponsored by Dream Dinners. Dream Dinners is a wonderful food preparation service that is offering our listeners $99 off their first order if you enter Mouse and Weens 99 at checkout. And let me tell you what that includes. This is a month's worth of meals, you guys, that is already chopped up, prepped. It's separated for you. It comes in a bag with instructions and it goes in your freezer so you can take it out and thaw it anytime that it's convenient for you and cook up a quick dinner 20 30 minutes. It is such a game changer for us. We cook dinners together as a family. We sit down and eat meals as a family and it's healthy food. It's great quality food and you can modify it according to your likes and dislikes. You can give them special instructions. It's perfect for people who don't know how to cook. It's so simple. I leave instructions out for the kids or my husband sometimes. They have looked into it and you save 20 hours a month from shopping and prepping. And really the cost of meals is about $6.50 per meal, which is so cheap when you think about it. So much cheaper than a lot of the other services. So do go to dreamdinners.com, look up your location. If you're within 25 miles of Poway or San Marcos locations, just enter Mouse Weens 99. You will get $99 off your first full order and you will receive free shipping. Free shipping, free delivery. They don't ship it, they bring it to you. Or you can go pick it up yourself. But it's so easy, you guys. Do it. It is such a life changer. Enjoy. It has a little bit of something for everyone in here, too. Um, Sleep training, the cry it out thing. That's important, too. I have so many friends having babies. And they do do the cry it out thing. um, But maybe modified. I don't know. I didn't believe in it, necessarily. It just hurt my heart too much to do it. Um, Yeah. But that was just my instinct, and for some people it works. But, you know, you probably advocate for try not to let them cry as much as you can because that's communication, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, yeah, there's just, like, there's certain things that I know are not, like, just they've studied it and we just know aren't good, and that really is one of them. Um, But there's the understanding, like, the reason that we're doing it is because when people are really tired – and they're trying to get sleep and they have to go to work. So there's other ways of trying to foster good sleep or to try to calm your baby that won't traumatize um, him or her. Right. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, it's kind of like um, spanking too. It's just like it's across the board is not good for your kids. Um, and not to say like, you know, people, some, and you know, people that don't even want to do it, do it sometimes too. And they feel bad about it afterwards. It just, I'm not, it's me it's normal it's it's normal that's normal but um (sighs) but we know that that's not that shouldn't be a go-to thing to do and you should really should try to avoid it and there's other ways of um creating discipline like that's very healthy and helping your child grow and lead them into adulthood in ways that are really like you know you're not a passive parent that's saying yes to everything and allowing your child to run around you, you, but, you know, going towards like why, what's causing the behaviors rather than just trying to beat them into submission, essentially. Right. So so what do you do with, are timeouts considered okay? Like what are the uh, good discipline? That's a controversial thing. I guess it's like a kind of, I'm so out of the loop with those, but um, I never did them. I don't think that they work at all, (laughs) but um, yeah, a lot of people think that they're, actually really like they negatively impact your child um 
I don't like that's definitely this for I don't really know any of the research that's on it. I definitely yeah. don't think it's the same as Spanky for Child. Um yeah. Yeah. for sure. But I was the you, queen yeah, of but... timeouts, man. I was all about that. And <laughs> Well, and what do you do in the place? Oh, I'm sorry, Joe. It was just a, if then, if you do this, then this is going to happen. It was almost teaching natural consequences, but just not letting them leave the spot and making them think about what they did. I don't know. I justified yeah, it at the time. The spanking was awful, though. I did that on the advice of a nurse. If there was something that was happening over and over and it was really bad, you have to do it one time and one time only, and they'll learn. And so I was like, okay, I got into this little lecture and I spanked Elliot and instantly felt awful and started crying. And But he didn't do the thing anymore. And um, yeah, but it still <laughs> haunts me. I wish I, I hadn't you're done crying. it. Probably to <laughs> see how much you cried afterward. Yeah. He was traumatized from that one. I don't think it's the spanking that changes the behavior. I mean, maybe if you, I don't know. I just think kids still do, they still get beatings. Like, you know, a lot of my friends who were kids would do things and get, you know, spanked pretty like with a belt even and they would continue mm. to be really naughty little kids yeah um, yeah 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 mm. so i uh, yeah i don't think it really i don't think it does but the spanking for sure they know rewires the brain too it's re- really negative i don't think timeout i don't think they do they, they're negative in in that way but they yeah there's a, that's like a big controversial thing apparently among among parents is talking about those those things i just think consistency was really key for the boys like so if you said something like hey you can't do that or we're gonna like we're at disneyland and they were doing something and you're like we have to leave my dad would be the, the king of being like okay and then keep giving us more and more chances and we're like yes. okay this is, you basically taught us how to like manipulate you at this point <laughs> but um yeah so you have to like if you say you're gonna leave you have to follow through and like leave if you're going to do something so take them away from whatever the, the thing is and then they start knowing, like, okay, like, she says we're going to leave or we're going to have to go to bed early or whatever. We really have to do it. Like, it's, we are, that's really going to happen. Yeah. Um, I wasn't that great with that, though, all the time. But <laughs> well, I really did see it work when I did do it right. It's a lot yeah. of energy to follow through on that stuff. And sometimes it ruins the whole family plan if you have to actually follow through right. on we're, mm-hmm. we're going to leave right. or something. Yeah, like, well, I don't want to go yet. I'm not yeah. done with Disneyland. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. exactly. But that's what I've heard, you know, in my limited amount of parenting books or whatever I've read. It was that the parents really do have to stay on top of the consequences. And they're harder to implement when they're not just, you know, of course, we don't want to slap and do it. But you really do have to follow through on what you say, which requires more effort. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. It's not, not easy to have children. I remember sitting there when the boys must've been like five or six and people were trying to get pregnant again, which I'm doing now, but I was, you know, once you're in it, when you're really in the trenches too, and you're like taking care of actually around six, they get really easy. So they must've been like three and four or somewhere around then. And they were, even going to the grocery store, how they never found me in the fetal position in Whole Foods crying, I don't know. Really, and every time I leave, and I'd be like, I'm never going shopping with them again. And then we'd be there the next day. <laughs> going in. Um, I did that to, to my mom. I think shoe shopping. She swore, like, I'm never going to the mall with your children again, because we were just trying to buy them shoes. And Poor grandma. She didn't know how rotten they could be out in public. It was hilarious. But it was right in that prime boy crazy. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, they're not, they mean nothing by it, too. They're not, like, intentionally naughty. They're just really curious and extremely active and have a lot of, like, energy. And so, and having two of them, like, I remember Shannon was curious and touched one thing in, like, you know, the the aisle with all of, like, the essential oils at Whole Foods. Mm. She touched something, didn't mean anything by it, just was curious about it, looked. And I was walking, and all of a sudden, I heard the entire <gasps> aisle clap. <laughs> and, it, and I just, I just didn't even look back, and I just kept walking forward. <laughs> just like a couple of things going to look. Quick! Um, yeah, Aram, yeah, Aram, Trader Joe's once had a whole um, shopping cart. I told him not to go on the, I was like, don't go on the side of the shopping cart, go on the front, or it's going to fall over on you, and he didn't listen. And sure enough, the whole thing fell over on top of him, and oh all my of, gosh. everybody was running. And he just kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I'm like, look how sweet he is. He's apologizing <laughs> for that. And I'm like, yeah, because he knows. I told him not to do that. Right. Um, yeah. It was just a, yeah, it was a lot of work. And then I was like, why would anybody intentionally have kids? I don't get this. And now I'm, <laughs> yeah, after you're, after you're out of it, you're like, oh, they were so cute back then. Oh, I, it's I a lot. 
I know. Yeah. And yeah, the bottom line too is we have to freaking support each other, moms. No more judgment. And let's yeah. just all look at each other across that grocery store and give the knowing look, the knowing nod instead of the scowly face. Yeah. Well, you know what? And that that's what was interesting when you brought up that you got a lot of haters when you had the Time Magazine or even on your blog. It seems like mothers, from what I've noticed, feel like they they do it the right way and everybody else is doing it the wrong way. So is that like a hormonal mother thing that you feel like you have to tell someone they're doing it wrong as a – like what is that? Mothers get so no, fired up. That's, a, that's guilt. That's a, so uh, when you – because if you notice like if you get a lot of – if you talk about attachment parenting in col- – like, you know, in college and a lot of people don't have kids yet – they're a lot more receptive to the idea. Once you have them, if you're saying something like, hey, this is really great or this works and you're not doing it that way, people are getting defensive because they have to protect how they're raising their children. Nobody nobody wants to think that they've done, they've hurt their kids. And so sure. like, I really understand that. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a defense mechanism that's just like a gut reaction to wanting to protect your child and also wanting to protect like you know, the way that you've raised them and, and trying to prove that you haven't done any damage. And so they'll general they'll typically go the opposite way and attack you. That's right. interesting. Okay. Thanks for explaining that. That was probably the best explanation of that I've heard. And it to- makes total sense, right? Because you, you don't yeah. have a rule book. You're gathering information. This is your baby and you have to justify why you've yeah. done it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So especially the polar opposite than what you did, your natural reaction is to be like, well, that's terrible. I didn't do that. And Mm -hmm. so um, you're wrong. Right. Um, And a a lot of projection too. Yeah. Maybe they see what you have and feel badly and yeah. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. You really threw yourself into the fire with this one, Jamie. This is a, I'm proud of you for agreeing to do that time magazine cover. I mean, like, are you, glad you did it or do you look back and regret it or I remember you said you didn't love the slogan they put next to it right the title oh yeah I didn't I didn't like that I didn't like the picture but they didn't really like the picture either we were that wasn't a picture that we necessarily posed for it wasn't one that we didn't pose for but we were they were fixing my hair they wanted me sitting and cradling Aram um like a Maria Laxon and he was just so big it was hard to cradle him and it was his nap time so he was nursing my hair is just like thin so they were trying to pull it back and they were trying to fix my outfit. And so he was standing there nursing, like getting really sleepy. So <laughs> I have to tell you, are... just for the people that can't see, it's the oh, yeah. title Absolutely. is Are You Mom Enough? And Jamie is standing there and Aaron is breastfeeding, but he's standing on a little kid chair. Right. So it I'm shows ho- how tall he is. And yeah, so she's holding it for the viewers. But um, yeah, that's interesting why they chose that one. Why do you think? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's definitely they call it the most incendiary cover of all time. As though what? it's, uh, yeah, I know. Which I was like, there's other words. Like, God is dead might have been a little bit more than that, but that's okay. Um, but <laughs> I think, well, what? They, how they explained it to? I mean, I really did. I liked everybody that we worked with at the time. I thought that they were all really honest and kind and. Uh, how they explained it was the first one, there's one at Time Lightbox. If you go there and look at all the photos, you'll see some of the other women who could have potentially been on the cover, the ones that they photographed um, the same day. And um, you can also see the photo that was supposed to make it on the cover, which was uh, I was sitting down and he had fallen asleep at that point and I was cradling him. Um, but because of the way, like they liked the fact that it was um, aesthetically the way that the, the composition of it, where I was tall, Mm-hmm. Um, and if you do look at like other covers, you don't see the other one. I was sitting down too low. There would have been too much empty space. I think mm-hmm. the tall, the height of that one worked really well. And it was also really controversial. I mean, yeah. they're, like, they're going to pick the one that it looks more that. dramatic. But I do think, right. Yeah. But I do think a lot of it was the fact that it was like how the, the standing did. They liked that better. But the um, yeah, the editors were in there and they definitely they didn't like it at the time. I remember that. Mm-hmm. So, like, no, 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 not this. But it was just because we were. We were just like, we were, yeah, just trying different things. It wasn't, that was not the shot that like we were really looking there. Anybody was looking for. You right. know what, Jamie? I just had a vision. Oh, vision. Let's hear I it. I had a vision that yeah. if you put out these books, there was a wonderful documentary series, which uh, I don't remember the name, but it was called like 25 Up. 
and then 45 up in the documentary filmmakers followed this group of people all throughout their life. And every five to 10 years, I can't remember, they would document how the people were doing. And it was just like an experiment to see how people are throughout their the course of their life. How did they turn out? What yeah. happened? And that would be so cool to find out your attachment styles working on your own children. And if you released a book every so often and uh, that would be really cool oh, yeah. because I'm looking into that now, all the attachment stuff. I mean, you really got me inspired and I'm looking at my own attachment styles and I've read a few books. And, and so we want to, now I'm having to trace back and go, what happened in the past that got me to this diagnosis of uh, preoccupied anxious? It would be cool to see what people. The What's the preoccupied part? I mean, I, I've know different mixtures of uh, attachment disorders, but I don't think I've ever heard that one. Before. Oh, I don't know. Maybe it was just some hokey test online, but it was basically oh, no, no. It's like say you stay pre like you have to keep yourself busy. Is that what it was? Saying? Do you remember I, what it said at all? I think maybe you're hyper vigilant because whatever happened, you're you hang back and you're very aware of all the moods in the room and maybe. You know, I think my sweet dad, I love him, but definitely there was a lot of ups, up and down moods and things. So you're maybe a kid that just happened to be, you know, you learned how to kind of walk on eggshells and to monitor everyone. So you do that now in adult life. So you're preoccupied yeah. by, why hasn't that guy called me? We just went on a date. How come he hasn't called me? He must be abandoning me. And the anxiety that comes Kind of with, the perseverating about the certain thought or something. Yeah, like that? obsessive thinking. And you're very vigilant of everyone's moods if in the room. So if, so, you know, if Joel, you, you uh, scowl at me, but you just that, stubbed your toe, I would think it was my fault or. Got it. Yeah, no, that's. That, the people pleasing and the uh, co kind of codependency and anxious attachment is all kind of together. It, it does really come from um, your parents, probably. To be honest, oh. uh, that's what they found. Typically, something happened, um, and it's not necessarily nothing necessarily negative, but like yeah, for whatever reason had you know there were certain things that had happened and the children really want to hyper please them um or just like make everything calm or like yes mm -hmm. make the make the water um but that's like i think the most common attachment disorder too so it's Got for it. all what it's everybody. did you so um, did you and you don't have to talk about this if it's too personal but what led you to your result of being more anxious did you figure out what that was and you don't have to talk about I, it if it's too personal. Oh, yeah. Um, I think it was my parents. They both have um, qualities about them. I was talking about this with my therapist last mm -hmm. week. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that they both, they had two different qualities where my mom, um, sorry, mom, but uh, she is more like a needy, needier person and would need to kind of confide in me with things. She wouldn't parentify me too too much, but she would tell me things that I think would upset me. And then my dad's more of like charming, you know, has narcissistic qualities, but uh, kind of more of a charming person. And that liked really big things, really exciting things. And they're both really lovely, like very loving people too. It's not like you have to have a bad childhood to have an attachment disorder, but there's certain things that they definitely you know, didn't a hundred percent do right just because of their own stuff. Um, yeah. That I think, yeah, when when they would just the way that they communicated with me, um, I would get very codependent or want to people please um, because of that. Um, and I was it that was that, it guilt that was operating a lot? Like guilt and shame seem to be these Brene Brown triggered terms that come up all the time. So. I mean, it sounds like you said the parentification is one, so the parents rely too much on the kid to listen to their issues. Uh, is that we what happened with dad, for sure. Yeah, she didn't do it too much, but it would be like, you know, if, like her dad died when I was two, and I remember her crying to me a lot. And, like, those are the things we know now that aren't really necessarily good for your children to see. Like, she needed me, like, to comfort her. Mm -hmm. Um, and I it, really, your children shouldn't be the ones to comfort you when you're in, in grief, your, your little children, your adult mm -hmm. children, it's a different thing. But, um, but even then it's, that's, that's a whole different conversation. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I think it was, I think they got it. I, and I think they have it too, but they got it from like the 
where like my grandparents and like you were very it's very much like keeping up with the joneses or like very presentational so everyone has to do everything right and it kind of like you kind of get scared into needing to perform um mm-hmm. correctly or and it's it's about like pleasing everybody else too. yeah and looking um, good so i think that comes up a lot in my yeah. thing is like looking mm-hmm. good to yeah. the outside world yeah it's a lot of pressure <laughs> Yeah, sure. yeah. So it is like, yeah, I don't want people to talk. <laughs> so mm-hmm. It's a, uh, it's, yeah, it's a weird thing. Um, but How did they deal with you going kind of public with stuff like this? Were they embarrassed at all or supportive? Or I think I know the answer, but I, I'm not sure. Oh, they were so supportive. But I think yeah. it's also because they're, yeah, but that, that's another part of like the very big, grand, everybody's doing something really impressive kind of thing. And so they, and then, but they also like, they also were very pro breastfeeding, but my mom would always like, even though she was, even though she breastfed me till she was six, I mean, she would kind of worry what people would think about things or she would be like, oh, well, she has a picture, although there was a picture of me at two years old over there, like over their fireplace in their bedroom of me breastfeeding. I know that picture. Um, In fact, Jamie, do you remember this? When I was just starting, I think I was a freshman in college. So you came along when Allie was 13, right? Is that how old she was? Yeah, I think she was close to 14. Okay, so yeah, I was there too. And you were like our little baby and we were the built-in babysitters and we just would play a doll with you and you were just the little sister you're so much fun and so cute and oh my gosh Gerber baby little model baby you're so pretty um still are but uh when I so that how many years is that I guess that's four years so you were four years old and um I did a report on watching kids it was a child psychology course and so I had to just observe you so I just sat in a room and watched you play and at one point, you came up to me and you said, Joelle, I have a secret. And I said, what? And you go, I still nuke on my mommy. Do you remember oh, yeah. this? Yeah, no, my mom remembers it because she thinks it's the sweetest story in the whole world. Yeah, <laughs> what yeah. The other day. It was... I don't remember doing it at all. Yeah, yeah. I, I found... I yeah, found the, the report I recently. I had typed it all up and everything oh, because it was like, it was sweet. And you were like... <laughs> you know, but it's okay. And I'm like, it is okay. And something I forget. But yeah, it was it was cute. You were. So I wondered, Jane, kinda... was there any Oh, I'm sorry, I get so excited with my question. No, no, that's good. But this was because you said it was a secret? Was there some shame that you might have carried from knowing no, that was like, but my, my mom must have felt no, I didn't care at all. <laughs> but I think she she must have done something for me to think that she wanted wanted didn't want people to know or like certain people to know like maybe we don't tell people that because they might talk mm-hmm. um which must be so common I, th- I would imagine that must yeah. happen a lot for parents who do this yeah absolutely um yeah I think that there's like that embarrassment like you know one wants to be laughed at and it's not there's nothing funny about it to be honest I mean, it's just like a really normal thing and um I think people aren't used to seeing it too so like especially an older child it, it looks different I think we're all used to seeing babies breastfeeding at this point but yeah. mm-hmm. I think um if you don't see it you know you it's not normal because because you also don't breastfeed as, as the children get older they're breastfeeding a lot like shorter spans it's like you come over and it's sometimes it's just a comfort thing for like three seconds you jump on and then you jump right off and they run off and go do something else so there's just not a lot of um, there's no reason you see it. Babies are getting all their nutrition basically from their mom. So you, they're breastfeeding a lot more and a lot longer. And these are quick little things here and there for comfort. And I mean, it's, the nutrition's still yeah. there too. But this um, comes back to the anthropological. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, no. We just are such, like you said, a puritanical Western society where it is interesting because that's sort of what we're talking about a lot in classes right now is just how we're founded on such a puritanical value set, but it's just a society. We just decided one thing is right. One thing is wrong, but there's so many cultures that probably breastfeed. I'm imagining, right? They're like culturally. Oh, most cultures you see um, a lot of Asian cultures, uh, many African cultures. Uh, the only time you see breastfeeding rates dip in underdeveloped areas too, is because of um, predatory marketing 
uh, which is, it goes against the WHO code, which the, the World Health Organization actually created a code because there's so many, what gets me is like, it, in these really impoverished areas without potable water, there are actual, they're aggressively marketing it to be this westernized, better for you thing for to have formula um, in these areas. And so the breastfeeding rates drop pretty dramatically. And also the infant mortality rates because of diarrhea go up like astronomically high too. Hmm. You're know, like, how can this like, I just don't. And then they're also trying to privatize water in those areas as well. Hmm. Which is just oh my me. God. That's really, really bad. Um, Nestle was like, they're, they've been known for years. Um, like decades to do it. There's all these boycotts, but they just keep getting there. People try to boycott them. I don't even try. They they own everything, and they just keep getting bigger and bigger. I think they own Pepsi, um, but they're yeah, their bottled water doesn't even come from yeah, a, a, a river or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nestle Life owns. They own everything. I mean, but mm-hmm. and it's not just them. There's other companies that do this too, but it's just. You would think that you're like, oh, these people don't have that much money, but it, it adds up and it becomes a, a big source of revenue for them, um, which is it, it, with, with a huge cost to it, too, of, of taking basically taking people's lives. So um, it's just awful. But yeah, but in other cultures, especially in like rural areas and places, you, you see this. It's just a natural part of and it's for survival, too, like in, in Ghana. Um, you would find the minimum age that you would see um, in the village that I was in, uh, weaning would be three. And that was like the minimum. And that was if like, and they would find like if you, something happened where the mom couldn't breastfeed or if someone died, a parent died, they would find a lactating relative or a neighbor or someone to breastfeed up until three years old because mm-hmm. it was such a, such a big form of um, nutrition, especially protein for, for children there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just like, it's just, just because we don't necessarily need it here doesn't mean that it's not beneficial or that it's harmful, especially, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's just, uh, but over there, it's like kind of a necessary thing. Yeah, right. Wow. That's so, yeah. I know, it's just from the perspective of like, we just get locked into how we do things. And so to see anything out of place, we really do, I think, as a society is thinking people, we need to just think beyond what we're used to just because we're used to it because society said it was okay. And as you just said, you know, how they shifted the the timeline. I don't know if it's the World Health Organization shifting it from one year to two years, but that's a perfect example of what we thought was strange was actually verified by scientists and everything else. So we need to just be more open-minded in this culture is my basic Yeah, it was actually, it was the American academy for pediatrics and i think that's why because with american it was they kept it really short and they finally joined the rest of the world on on their recommendations but Mm -hmm. yeah no it's absolutely you're right and i think it's a lot of it is you know disempowered patriarchal culture and and rape culture um that's creating this sort of it's we have a lot of sexual repression and like hyper hyper sexuality in our culture too and I think the schism of those two things because we're hyper sexual like we are obsessed with sex in a weird way that's like almost too, it's not it's not even normal and normal. We're, I, I think it's because we're sexually repressed and because of that the schism I think creates yes. sexual pathology and then you get a lot of things like oh this. my god look at TikTok and then look at how people talk about sex being bad and look at our 13 year olds doing sexy dances on yeah. TikTok and it's like it doesn't add up you know there's some repression yeah. that's going to happen and rape yeah mm-hmm. absolutely yeah and just like normalizing that and and then you see like the pendulum swinging the other way now and people are like they're they're picking up on it but like it the way that it has to work too to like for people to point it out is like it's ugly both ways too it's just like this isn't an easy thing but it needs to be addressed and fixed in our culture i think we're trying to now a little bit but it's going to be a long road ahead how do we like jamie you are so good at well you've written uh, did you write about this anywhere like how do we fix that no. problem is it? <laughs> I, I think. With, How do we fix the world, Jamie? With, Please tell us. <laughs> I think that people need to talk about their being abused um, if when they're ready for it, and then we, as a society, just need to believe them too. I know it's like, it's, I think there's a, 
an issue with like Amber Heard is a great example of that too, where it's just, it's one of those things they both were abusing each other. There's, I don't think that there's any, any doubt of that, but right. you know, it's, but, ha- but that's been used really negatively to talk about, you know, women who lie about things and um, lie about their sexual abuse. And uh, I, I think it's like, it's derailing the conversation that we are having and it's not making it easier. It's like, we just need to agree and support women who say that they've been abused, period. Like that's exactly. just, you, yeah, that's the only thing that we can do to move forward. Otherwise we're creating all these weird convers- side conversations that are going nowhere. That's true. And maybe like in the educational system, we're still pretty puritanical there, right? Where we just talk about anatomy as anatomy and not like taking care of someone emotionally when you have intercourse or some of the other nuances. I don't think they go there at all, right? Yeah. And I just learned too, in some of the Scandinavian countries, they will teach their adolescents um, sex ed in in school includes how to be kind to someone, how to... um, talk to your girlfriend and support her, how to hold her hand, um, all the emotional stuff first, and then they get into the physical stuff. They are so much, they're they're always ahead of us. I know. It's like light bulbs. Come on, people. Let's do this. Yeah, they're considered happier. I don't know. They're just, they've just, they've really figured it all out. But yeah, um, yeah, no, I think the other, yeah, the other one was, remember in Z's and Zari, I don't know if I'm saying his name right, and that one, I read the woman's thing, and I was like, this doesn't really look like a rape, it looks like a bad date, but in the new, but it's the nuanced parts of that that need to be addressed, where it was like, he, if you look at it, she said she was uncomfortable, but she didn't say anything, and like, those are the things, like, he looks like a, he looks like a jerk, like, I would never want my kids to behave like him. But I, it also wasn't a sexual assault. He just was a, like, he's a dorky guy who suddenly got famous and girls wanted to go out with him. And and I think that he took advantage of that. But like not understanding, like if someone isn't like walks out of your, ha- you have a sexual encounter with the person and you think it's consensual, but she leaves in tears. Like who wants someone to cry? <laughs> right, yeah. You know, like that yeah. should make you feel bad. I'm assuming that should be like a negative emotion. Yeah. And so it's just like understanding like, hey, this person doesn't seem that into this right now. Maybe I should pull away. Maybe I should check in on them. Yeah. Uh, we haven't we haven't learned that. If this consent is like yes means yes, no means no. Like we I think we've all figured that out at this point after like me too and everything, but it's it goes deeper than that. Yeah, now I just heard that they are starting to film selfie videos. Couples are, a a guy and a girl. Like, yes, I agree that we are about to have sex. Yes, I agree. Okay, everybody sees this. And they lock it up, you know, (laughs) hit stop, and it's saved for good. And then everybody's protected, which seems so clinical. But maybe in this day and age, we need that. I don't know. No, that seems that seems really unsexy, but it also doesn't really work because if she decides halfway through she doesn't want to anymore and he that's continues, just that's considered rape too. You can like stop at any time. Right. Um right. Yeah. so yeah, and that's so, the other thing they try to teach, I guess, in, in college or high school. I don't know where they're doing this. I think college. But you know, keep asking along the way, is this okay? Are you sure? Mm-hmm. You still okay? You still okay? So it's all about consent. And I hope it makes a change, but yeah, it's, it's, but But has anyone, okay, I have to ask you ladies, has anyone done that with you in your, and I know Jamie, you've been married and Joel's been married for a long time, but did you ever have those conversations? Not really. I've known a lot of people. (laughs) I do marriage. Um, No, I never, I dated a lot of athletes though. And I remember like if I were, was trying to say something and I was, being playful about something and said no I've had it happen multiple times they will jump off of me and be like no means no I'm like no I didn't mean it like that yeah. at all <laughs> they're <laughs> like I'm gonna get kicked off the team I, got, I gotta stop <laughs> yeah. oh my god yeah they just, they don't want a lawsuit they do not want like yeah they do not want anyone yeah. trying to like you know short them for money or something like that and you're just yeah. like oh my gosh like you're like there's trauma there on the other end too but it's I it's a lot different than than it is for women but you're like yeah. oh okay that was drilled in you somewhere <laughs> yeah that's good though I mean that's a good sign of progress yeah. right yeah. or you just choose yeah, really nice guys really- yeah, but really- being the mom of boys too, I was just gonna address it from that angle. It's like we do have to teach our boys um, 
the the care involved and 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 everything they have to do along the way. Oh, it's a yeah, lot of parenting absolutely. that needs to happen. What were you going to say, Jamie? Oh, I don't remember. I think oh. it was just I know. <laughs> spur of the moment. All right. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to say about your book that was really important to you in writing it or a subject that you want people to know about? No, I think it's mm-hmm. just, I'm really proud of it. I love it. But it's just, it's one of those ones If you, yeah, if you're interested in the topic, I recommend it highly. If not, snooze your way through it, probably. <laughs> Got it. No, I think it's it's got good things. And tell us about Alanis too. I know I talked about that before, but um, are I, you guys I still have. friends? And oh yeah, she wrote she wrote the introduction um, for me too, and kind of talks about her experience being the time cover for the first time, and uh, it's really sweet. So it just that's more. I just try to keep that private because she's was a private person. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And she reached out to you because she's, she saw you on the cover yeah. and, and knew what you might be going through and has a similar background yeah. and, and parenting style. And I love that. Yeah. Very good. Nice. And then now you're married and trying to get pregnant. This Woo! is the next chapter. Yeah. Good luck with everything there. I hope, um, I hope it goes smoothly. Thanks. Yeah, it's not going smoothly. It's taking a long time, but that's okay. Maybe we won't we we won't be able to get pregnant. And we'll just kind of move on from there. But we're we're going through a bunch of IUIs right now, which is like right before IVF. Um, it's okay, not what does that mean? Experience. All these acronyms. I'm just I mean- IUI is inner uterine insemination. So what they do, very interesting. So it's um, they'll give me which I ovulate on my own, but they just do it anyway, just to cover all your bases. They give you something that makes you crazy, fully crazy um, to ovulate. So you can get, um, sometimes there's more than one follicle too. So your chances of having multiples are higher, um, which I really am not excited about. Anymore, but um, can you imagine? Work, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they give you an HCG trigger shot, which is the hormone, the pregnancy hormone. It's supposed to kind of ripen up the, the follicles and make the, and then have them pop off. So you have this egg about 48 hours later, 36 hours later, they um, ha- take your husband's or your partner's uh, semen sample and um, they wash the sperm. <laughs> hmm. they don't, uh, yeah, they spin it and wash it. And then whatever, whatever is um, left, is uh, really a concentrated amount of sperm. There's no semen left in it, and um, and then you uh, they make you put it in your cleavage and walk to another room, and then they take this instrument and they stick it through your um, a catheter through your cervix into your uterus, and they plop it in there and hope it finds the egg. Wow! <laughs> wow! Yeah, the cleavage just to keep it warm and at that temperature, yeah. right? Is that why? Oh my god! Oh my <laughs> gosh! Wild, very sexy. Well, yeah, can you take video of this? That sounds really <laughs> interesting. <laughs> yeah, I do. I have. I'll send you some. I took okay. some. Well, that's always the people don't want to be videotaped too. It's really not. It's like it. It, it looks like I'm getting a pop smear. It's really not that exciting. Um, right. But we've taken pictures. I was me walking around with it in my cleavage because I was excited. <laughs> talking to it oh. well that's good you're, yeah. you're already getting attachment oh. parenting right there from the very beginning yep. Jamie you have such a good <laughs> yeah there you go you have such a good attitude you sound like you're just resilient as hell yeah and that's amazing do you feel that I mean are you just pretty joyful you've done all this wonderful stuff you've been through the oh through all those comments and I don't know how do you feel is life good? Those don't, yeah, those don't bother me at all. I'm getting a lot of therapy. So I think that that really does help everything. And yeah. just, uh, yeah, and life is, I used to, I was traveling nonstop up until um, about a year ago. And then I now just, I'm at home all the time and mm. cooking and gardening. And so I think life, it's a little slow sometimes, a little too slow, but I think it's helped re-regulate my nervous system. That's so good. That's good. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. you were yeah, a world traveler and and doing a little bit of everything. I loved it. Um, kind of watching your journey, and here you are now. So I'm very proud to see how you've grown up, Jamie. <laughs> and I say that as as your honorary big sister over here, and the fact that our parents were kind of best friends back in the day. In fact, when I interviewed mom before this interview, she said that her only sources of um, support really when she had 
Well, more when she had Julianne because she had just moved to California. Where your mom and Karen. And that was it. Those were her two people. And they would just call each other on the phone. And so it's kind of like, here we are, full circle. <laughs> oh, but, I know. I think that's so sweet that my mom was, my parents remember you guys being around. I think your dad went to go um, for like a summer to down to, to do acting and stuff. And so your mom was there with you guys. And my parents hung out with you guys all the time. And Aww. that's, I think, you and Allie were so close, but they were like, yeah, just making sure that your mom was okay when she was by herself and everything. And it was just really sweet. They had, I think that they just really got, you know, got super attached to everybody because yeah. you were like, thanks for part of the family. Definitely. Yeah. Johnny was Allie's, or Johnny was Allie. I, I said it again. What's wrong with me? Now I have pregnancy brain. Johnny was Julianne's <laughs> little buddy. Allie was my buddy. Yeah. And then you came along as chapter two, and that was that was awesome. But, yeah, there you go, Julianne. You can blame Dad. That was the summer he went down to L.A. to become a stuntman. Oh, see? That's my attachment Leaving issues. Leaving us. <gasps> oh. Yes. He became a stuntman? I didn't know that. I thought he was trying to – I thought he was doing, like, mo- like movies or something. So, oh, gosh, that's really dangerous. It was, it was, yeah, he worked at a um, ranch uh, called Zorothean's Ranch in Altadena and as a day camp counselor, a summer counselor in exchange for free room and board. And then he could use their equipment to learn all his stunts. So he was jumping motorcycles. He was running on horses and falling off horses. He was falling off buildings into big pads. And that was the summer he did that. So, yeah, yeah, kind of wild, but thank you for your family for picking up the slack <laughs> yeah thank you oh, yeah. It, was slack. it was more just like you know they were just around so it was it was just that was what his dream and he wanted to do it and i think that they were everybody was supporting it and then just yeah. making sure you guys were okay while you were there yeah so, like, yeah yeah the village of sorts yeah we sure had fun oh well jamie um, best of luck with everything and i love watching your journey and where can people find you that might want to follow along too what and get your book yes Uh, my book you can go to amazon and find my book and then also it's i think it's probably attached to my instagram account which is just my name uh which i think it's jay grumet as my handle but um yeah just look up search my name and you'll find me yeah she's she's fun to watch and and good stuff and your boys are gorgeous and and huge and it's really cute and you're a good mom i know (laughs) such a good mom we will put everything into the show notes um all of the links for everybody listening so just scroll down to below this episode and you'll see them there and um yeah we'll go from there but we love you jamie thank you jamie (laughs) thank you all right (laughs) talk to you soon bye okay sounds good love you guys Bye. bye listen while you're driving thank you for subscribing mouse and weens are thriving with your help with your help listen while you're cleaning You'll be mouse and weaning. Thank you for believing in our show. Thank you, Megan, Joyce, Carla, and Jody, for subscribing to Patreon. You are a Patreon dream. Come get your mouse and weans for dirty words and naughty bits and things that are PG. Get the naked long uncut mouse and wings at patreon.com backslash mouse and wings. Ever wonder why your kid won't listen? Ever wonder why your mom is so bossy? Well, we do all the time. That's why we created our podcast. Love these mom and daughter talks with Bryn and Flynn. Through a series of open and honest conversations, Flynn and I hope to deepen our understanding of each other and help other parents and children deepen their understandings of what goes on in their day-to-day struggles. <laughs> and more. We are officially now on the Podfix Network. Also, find us anywhere you download your podcasts. Hey, Flynn, I love these mother daughter talks. Me too. Let's see you in our next episode. This was a podcast of the Podfix Network. You can check out more shows like it at podfixnetwork.com.